It's Friday, it's the 11th of July. You're watching Arirang Korea's only global network. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gon Young. Now, let's begin this Friday afternoon at the nation's top office. President Park Geun-hye, who made attempts to renew dialogue with the two main rival political parties this week, has a very important political decision to make. Well, she has secured bipartisan agreement for passage of her key reform and economy related bills, but the main opposition has asked that the president consider withdrawing some of her cabinet nominations. Our Choi Yusun explains. President Buck has often been criticized for her lack of dialogue and communication with the opposition party. She countered that criticism this week by meeting with the ruling and opposition party's floor leadership for the very first time. The president and both parties' floor leaders met for talks, and the fact that we are going to meet on a regular basis means we are restoring politics. A major development from Thursday's talks was an agreement to pass within the month a bill designed to prevent a repeat of tragedies like April's deadly ferry accident. The policy chiefs of the two parties will start negotiating the bill within the standing committees, with an aim to pass this special legislation on the Sewolho Ferry in the July 16th plenary session. The ruling in opposition sides also agreed to seek passage of the government's post-ferry disaster reform bills and bills aimed at revitalizing the economy in August. But with five of President Buck's eight cabinet nominees confirmed by the parliament, the opposition has specifically requested the president reconsider two of the three remaining nominees for their alleged thesis plagiarism and false testimony. Although the president can appoint her cabinet without parliamentary confirmation, there's a big political risk if she goes ahead without considering the opposition's request. President Buck also has to think about how her decision could affect public sentiment ahead of the July 30th by-elections. On the other hand, the president cannot afford any further delays in her government and public sector reform plans after her two failed prime minister nominations. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. Well, the United States and China say they see eye to eye on North Korea's denuclearization. Wrapping up their two-day annual talks in Beijing Thursday, both sides agreed on the important urgency of curbing Pyongyang's nuclear weapons program, but uh, that was just about it that they agreed on because they remain divided on how uh, they will approach and persuade the reclusive state to do that. Archie Myungil reports. The U.S. and China promised closer cooperation on denuclearizing North Korea at the sixth round of U.S.-China strategic and economic dialogue. The U.S. says China shares the same strategic goal and that Beijing must use its unique role to persuade Pyongyang to give up its nuclear ambitions. However, the U.S. State Department declined to comment on whether Washington and Beijing had agreed to enforce sanctions on North Korea more rigorously. China has been an important partner in the implementation of sanctions, and even as recently as last year, they took a number of important steps. China's top diplomat Yang Jiechi said Washington and Beijing reaffirmed the importance of realizing the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula through consultations, and that two countries can do more to relax the situation. During a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said both Washington and Beijing agreed to work harder. But I do want to emphasize that we reach agreement that we need to both do more and we are prepared to in order to try to move North Korea on the subject of its denuclearization. South Korea and the U.S. have long called on China, North Korea's only major ally, to play a greater role in urging North Korea to demonstrate its willingness to give up its nuclear weapons as a precursor to the resumption of denuclearization talks. But experts say Beijing has still been more accommodating toward Pyongyang. Still, there is a growing consensus among the Chinese leadership that the country needs to change its policies towards North Korea, even taking a harder line as Pyongyang has begun interfering with China's interests in the region. 
지명길 아리랑 뉴스. Well, across the globe, at least 88 Palestinians are reported dead in a three-day-long conflict on the Gaza Strip. And it's got world leaders calling for a ceasefire, and that includes U.S. President Barack Obama and U.N. Security General uh, Ban Ki-moon. And our Kwon Tua has the latest on that report. The U.S. says it's willing to broker a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The White House said U.S. President Barack Obama told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the phone Thursday that he's ready to help end the escalating hostilities on the Gaza Strip. He also reiterated that Israel has the right to defend itself against Palestinians' rocket attacks. Secretary of State John Kerry spoke to his Egyptian counterparts trying to make him use Egypt's influence in easing the situation, as the country played an important role in brokering an Israel-Hamas ceasefire two years ago. The surge in rocket fire was triggered amid an Israeli crackdown on Hamas members, which began after the abduction and killing of three Israeli teenagers last month. A suspected revenge murder of a Palestinian teenager followed a few days later. Hamas has reportedly launched over 550 rockets into civilian areas in Israel. Israel responded with over 500 airstrikes, part of their Operation Protective Edge, launched earlier in the week. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon made a passionate appeal for a ceasefire during an emergency session, saying Gaza was on a knife edge. Uh, today, we face the risk of an all-out escalation in Israel and Gaza, with the threat of a ground offensive still palpable and preventable only if Hamas stops rocket firing. The UN chief called on the international community to work with Israeli and Palestinian leaders to stop the situation from escalating and said the region cannot afford another full-blown war. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Well, let's bring you back to the Korean Peninsula. More than 60 years of separation have made North and South Korea two very different places. And although Koreans from both sides of the border share the same language, their understanding of one another is very limited. This is most true among the younger generation of South Koreans who will be looked upon to lead if and when unification occurs. It was with this in mind that the Korean government hosted a special youth camp, and our Shin Se-min was there. This 24-year-old North Korean defector, known only by his family name Kim, fled his home country because of economic hardships. His first attempt at defecting ended in failure, and he was sent back to the North, where he ended up serving time in a prison camp for fleeing. But his desire for freedom never waned, and Kim finally made it safely to the South seven years ago. Facing some 100 South Korean middle school students at a youth unification leader camp held on Thursday, Kim and one other North Korean defector shared their stories as part of a program organized by South Korea's Ministry of Unification. The goal is to raise awareness among younger South Koreans about their neighbors to the North and prepare them for possible unification in the future. Now that Kim is legally a South Korean citizen, he says he wants to study. I want to study so I am prepared for the future, especially when the two Koreas unite, because I have to help those North Koreans adjust to the changes. And until that day comes, South Korean students have goal of their own. Spreading the vision for unification is something I continue to do with my friends, so eventually I can go to the North and better appreciate our history through cultural assets. Although we were brought up under different political systems as Korean people, it is our job to embrace all people until we can freely commute anywhere on the peninsula. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Well, uh, this may be surprising, but for many South Koreans, Japan poses the second biggest military threat following North Korea, and that's according to a survey conducted by the East Asia Institute in Seoul and the Japanese think tank. Well, the results of the survey, which was released Thursday, are an indication of South Koreans' discomfort with Japan's view of history, as well as its uh, latest move to expand the role of its military. Over 46 percent of South Korean respondents chose Japan as the most threatening country, following North Korea with over 80 percent. 
Well, last year in a similar poll, Japan ranked third, trailing North Korea and China. Some 2,000 South Korean and Japanese adults took part in this year's survey conducted throughout May and June. Now, shifting our focus, the World Cup in Brazil reaches its climax this weekend with Sunday's final. Well, no one really expected Korea to still be in it, but um, I think everyone hoped that they'd put in a stronger showing than they actually did. Head coach Hong Myung-bo has stepped down to take responsibility, but the deep-rooted problems with Korean football remain. And our Song Ji-san goes over what they are. Someone had to take responsibility, and this time, it was two people who withdrew from their positions. The vice president of the Korea Football Association stepped down on Thursday, along with head coach Hong Myung-bo. The seat is empty for now, but it won't be an easy position to fill. Ten managers have held a highly coveted seat over the past dozen years, after Gus Hitting led the Korean squad to a fourth-place finish at the 2002 Korea-Japan World Cup. But each has only stayed for slightly over an year on average, after one or more losses in international matches that brought them under fire. Selection of the national team coach has generally been a top-down decision from Korea's Football Association. Its technical committee must provide professional insight to the process, but lacks the authority to influence the decision-making process. Now, the incumbent president of Korea's football governing body says that will change. We plan to reform the technical committee so the team can perform better on the international stage. We'll also restructure all levels of the organization so that it better caters to the national squad's needs. Those reforms and the selection of the candidates for national team coach must take place soon, with the next international match set for September and the Asian Cup in January just six months away. Song Ji-san, Arirang News. Well, uh, global stock markets slipped on fresh concerns over the health of a leading Portuguese bank. The latest crisis in the European nation is raising fears that the country could fall into financial trouble once again. Our Huang Jihei has an explanation. Stock markets in the United States and especially in Europe took a hit on Thursday. Markets in Europe dropped across the board, while Wall Street recovered most of its nerve at the opening of trading with the Dow, Nasdaq and S&P 500 losing around half a percent. So what is haunting the market? The soundness of Portugal's top bank, Banco Espírito Santo. The tension centers on Espírito Santo International, the largest shareholder in the bank. It allegedly missed a debt payment this week and was held responsible for accounting irregularities. Amid the feeble pace, of economic recovery in Europe, analysts say the shock in global stock markets shows that investors are still very worried about the overall financial health of the region. That's also raising fears that Portugal might face a crisis again just about a month after emerging from a bailout. Portugal's regulator halted trading at the troubled bank after its share price crashed 17 percent. The Portuguese government insists that the bank is solid and that the drop in stock prices simply reflects trouble at the parent company. Investors, however, are skeptical, saying they have heard such reassurances in Europe before and that the size of the problem remains unclear. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Now, uh, chunsei prices in Korea are fast closing in on record levels, in fact, and that's according to KB Kumin Bank's real estate statistics. For those of you who are not too familiar with this, chunsei is a unique system in Korea where tenants, instead of uh, paying rent, cough up a hefty upfront deposit, typically a large percentage of the property's value, which is then refunded in its entirety or renewed after a set period. While well, the nation's chunsei to purchase price ratio climbed to a near 69 percent last month, which is a single percentage point shy of its highest level on record set in uh, back in October 2001. The southwestern city of Gwangju showed the highest at 78 percent, followed by the southeastern city of Daegu. Seoul was at 64 percent.
And analysts attribute uh, the upward trend to a growing number of people feeling less inclined to buy because of uncertainties about the nation's housing market. Now, uh, on this July 11th, World Population Day is marked around the world. But the data shows Korea faces a bleak future in that regard. A study by the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade shows Korea's competitiveness will soon begin to wane due to the shrinking number of economically active people, and that's because of the fast aging population and the extremely low birth rate. Well, it also says Korea will fall into the lower ranks of OECD countries in 16 years. Korea's competitiveness through population is expected to fall to 21st place by the year 2030 from 17th place in 2010. The institute adds that the nation needs a strategy to boost the birth rate before it becomes an extremely serious economic and social conundrum. Now, on to other news. Another science fiction fixture has become a reality. Korea's LG Display, the flat screen maker of LG Group, of course, has unveiled an 18 inch flexible OLED panel. The panel can be rolled into a cylinder with a radius of 3 centimeters without affecting any of its functions. The display maker also revealed a transparent OLED panel of the same size with a transmittance of 30 percent. Now, LG plans to develop both transparent and uh, rollable panels of more than 60 inches by 2017. And all this in a bit to lead the race in the display market. Well, just when we thought the Eurozone fears were no more, the Euro scare is back. Concerns about the Portugal uh, rattled the financial markets worldwide yesterday and today. Eurozone trouble and the global reaction. So is this another typical case or are things somewhat different this time? Joining me live in the studio for discussion is, of course, our regular contributor, Dr. Kim byung Ju. So, Dr. Kim, what do you think? Um, will this be another typical case, or is it nothing like we've ever seen before? Well, the way I see it, this case of Banco Espirito Santo itself is not exactly a typical case of financial panic here because this is not a bank run where investors or depositors get you know, freaked out and then just run to the bank and pulling their, their money out. It's just a, uh, another, not a typical case of uh, financial planning, but a typical case of mismanagement of the bank itself. We're hearing a lot about these wrongdoings and misconducts and, you know, cooking up their uh, financial books and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a lack of ethics rather than kind of speculation or, or panic among the investors that we are seeing in this case. So I would say this is not a typical case of uh, financial panic. But then again, on the other hand, in terms of its uh, potential theoretical impact itself, could be something that's typical because investors are always looking for an excuse to make a run. Uh, basically, mm. you know, when you're investing in any kind of asset market, you want to be the first one in when the prices are low. And then when the prices continues to go up, you're watching out very carefully to be the first one out. And if this is a kind of trigger for any other cases that could follow, uh, this could actually become a serious case. But for now, I th we know the situation is being managed uh, pretty okay now. And then recently we just uh, heard a, a s not exactly similar case, but another like a panic concerns about, uh, you know, a Argentina, for instance, a mm -hmm. few days ago. So right now, overall global financial market is not actually up to that p uh, point where people are looking for excuses to run. So in theory, this could be case of a trigger, but in practice, for now, we're not seeing this case becoming a trigger. So that's a little bit of relieving. 
Right, a sigh of relief uh, mm -hmm. by many, I'm sure. Right. Now, this week, the New York Times ran an article, mm -hmm. or carried an interesting article, on the growing fears about the excessive liquidity in the market um, worldwide. Right, right. Uh, would you say there's any link between that, uh, that excessive liquidity, and, and this, the current trouble in Portugal? Potential link is uh, pretty much there. I talked about the theoretical impact of this kind of scare as a trigger point. Indeed, uh, I think it was July 7th when uh, news, uh, Newsweek printed and then posted online about so-called everything boom. Right now, we know for the last six years, you know, central banks around the world have been increasing the liquidity uh, uh, supply of the cash into mm -hmm. the into the economies all around. Not just the United States QE, but also uh, you know European Bank, Central Bank, and then China and even Japan, right? Mm -hmm. Abenomics. So they've been kind of like pumping in this kind of money into the market for now. And as a result of it, as we all suspected, things are going up. The prices of assets are going up. This New York Times report talked about Spain's case, recent case of bond mar uh, bond market, especially their treasury bond in the st Spain market, offering the lowest ever interest rate ever since what, 1789? Mm -hmm. Because there's just so much cash out there that are eager to buy these kind of bonds. Sp Spanish bonds, by the way. Right, right. Right, not one of those uh, safer ones, mm -hmm. relatively speaking. And New York, we're talking about this real estate market continuously going up. Every month, their prices of these real estates going up in New York and in even France huge junk bond deal that was made possible in the market only because the cash supply is uh, there. So indeed, we see because of this six years of pumping in of the money into the market and also uh, not only that, but businesses all around the world, same problem here in Korea as well, businesses not investing. Mm. Uh, their fund whatever into a actual business investment trying to keep the cash under their belt. These are all increasing this kind of risk all around the world. So indeed when a New York Times called this everything boom, I think it makes a lot of sense and when everything is booming, all the investors are watching out for excuse to run and mm. any kind of trigger event. So indeed Theoretically, there is a tight link between this kind of, or not necessarily this one, but this kind of event triggering a run. Well, uh, Dr. Kim, I think mm -hmm. you and I discussed this uh, several times extensively, the, the way excessive liquidity might lead to the financial crises. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about, you know, the U.S. Bank, Central Bank, just um, printing out money, right. and it's, it's nothing that we have ever seen before. Right. So the ramifications mm -hmm. we would not be able to foresee. Mm -hmm. So we never know what's going to happen. Right. But at this time, would you say this is serious? Um, you know, I think we have to watch out. We're not talking about Portuguese case here, but serious meaning the overall mm -hmm. everything boom. Uh, yeah. I think this is, in theory, serious. We have learned over the decades, let's go back only if uh, we have other cases in the back, but let's go only back to like 1970s uh, when oil shock hit the world market, oil prices went up because of the oil, you know, OPEC oil embargo. That money went into New York and London market and these bankers in New York and London pumped that cash into what? Latin America. And Latin America could not actually circul uh, uh, circulate, if you will, this capital effective way to offer in enough of return. So investors got angry or upset, not happy about it. They pulled their money out. There was Latin America debt crisis during mm -hmm. the uh, late 70s and 80s. 19, even like, let's make a big jump, 1990s uh, in Asia, right? The dollar coming into Asian markets with all these excitements, but all of a sudden with Thailand uh, bad trouble and other troubles in currencies, w w with, uh, which Korean case followed later on, all the investors got panicked and they pulled all the dollars out of Asian market. Same thing. 98 liquidity, financial crisis. Yeah, right, liquidity right. causing this kind of crisis and panic all the time. 2008, same thing. You know, mm. all this excitement about the financial market, subprime crisis, uh, subprime, um, you know, like uh, driving up the financial market and all of a sudden people were watching out and then got scared and pulled their money out, again, collapse. Same thing about the European markets 2008 following the Wall Street trouble. You know, like uh, real estates in, uh, you know, pigs countries as well as all other countries, even Northern Europe, real estate market was going up because of the liquidity and the excitements about the financial uh, market. And then all of a sudden panic and then collapse. Same kind of story uh, repeats again and again. So this time, once again, when we hear about this kind of everything boom, we have to watch out.
Well, you know, uh, Korean shares today, Seoul shares mm -hmm. ended at 1988, which was down 0.7 percent from right. the day before. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, the Korean shares did respond to the Portuguese uh, trouble, I suppose. Right. And it seems they like, showed their respect. Right. Well, <laughs> respect by 0.7 right. percent. Right. Uh, it seems like Korea weathered the 2008 crisis pretty well. That's true. What are some of the uh, points, that key points for Korea to keep in mind in order to deal with a potential next round of crisis? Oh, uh, the, the answer would be too long. So I'll we make it very uh, brief. Uh, we talked about interest rate yesterday, and just if we are thinking about any possibility of financial panic with regard to Korean market, this is not the time to cut interest rate here mm -hmm. because we are expecting, as I mentioned, towards the end of the year, we are expecting the United States to raise its interest rate. So we are expecting some reasonable amount of capital flow out of this market. So if we cut the rate now, it will actually make the overall case worse. Keeping the rate up there in place would actually make overall situation safer for Korea. That's only, of course, if we are talking only with regard to the financial crisis possibilities. Of course, we do have all these domestic economic concerns. So that's a little bit of a different story. But for now, interest rate, we should keep it up for the sake of avoiding financial crisis. All right. Uh, Dr. Kim byung ju thank you so much for today, all of this week. We will talk to you next week. Okay. And that is your business today on this Friday. Thank you for watching. And do join us again at 6 p.m. Korea time on Early Dish Net 6.